Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind introduction, Dennis. Um, maybe I should take like two minutes to introduce what is the UNSCN, and then also to place this into uh, uh, the context of uh, place this session in the context of, of the UNSCN, the Global Nutrition Agenda, and. Uh, and the Global Nutrition Agenda. So the UNSCN is the United Nations Standing Committee on Nutrition. And what we basically do is we, we maximize policy coherence among the UN agencies in the area of, uh, of nutrition. So that will boil down to consistent delivery by those same agencies to support governments in countries to achieve the global nutrition targets. So that is it in a nutshell. In order to do that, it's for important that we track emerging issues, for example, uh, rural urban uh, transformation and how that impacts on nutrition and of course knowledge sharing that's also an important aspect of our work. So what is the global nutrition agenda? Many people already mentioned something about the, the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda, leaving no one behind, inclusiveness, uh, equality, that, those are words that we heard already this morning. But what we, I did not yet hear this morning, this, this day so far, is that now, all of us, we live in the decade of action on nutrition. And that means that now we have a window of opportunity of 10 years to really accelerate our investments into, into better nutrition in order to accelerate also the achievement of these sustainable development goals. How do we do that? Well, that's the other global nutrition agenda we have. That's the um, International Conference on Nutrition Outcomes that give us some insight how to do that. One of these insights is um, that we should transform our uh, food systems into food systems that are sustainable and resilient and that work for healthy, healthier diets and nutrition. The ICN2, the International Conference on Nutrition, said maybe we should work towards local food systems. And that brings us back to this event today, because I heard already many people say, okay, global food system, food systems, nice, but if you look at rural urban dynamics, you zoom in at the local level. So that's very interesting. <coughs> How does that work? What does that mean for nutrition? And also, what does that mean for governance? Because it means you are not just looking at national governments, but also at local governments. Um, so we are looking at transformation of food systems in order for better nutrition. That means that we need to know how they work, how they function. That was one of the questions this morning. And in fact now, we are zooming in on the marketing aspects and the value chain aspects. If we better understand the marketing and the value chain, we will be able to also nudge them to work better for, for nutrition. Um, we will have Bart Minton and we will have Delia Grace. Bart Minton will zoom in uh, to the value change um, and the marketing aspects. Of course, they will tell us something how producers and consumers are linked. <coughs> producers always concerned about income and livelihoods, consumers concerned about food safety, healthy diets, but also affordable foods. But these are not two different worlds. All producers are also consumers, and consumers are sometimes also producers. And they are definitely also worried about their livelihoods and income. So we are looking at grey areas and I hope that, uh, that the presentations that follow will give us some insight how that works so that we will know where to and how to nudge these uh, systems in order to work better for nutrition. Um, so I will give the floor to, to Bart Minton. And Bart Minton is, uh, is uh, based in Ethiopia working on agriculture, he is in fact an agriculture economist, if I can summarize it in, in that way. Um, before working in, uh, in Ethiopia, <laughs> you also worked quite some time in India, and what I understand, you are, you've been teaching all over the world as well. So the floor is yours, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. I hope you will be able to stick to a maximum of 15 minutes. Afterwards, we will take short questions, no statements. The statements, as our colleague from SMV said, will follow in a later session. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I Good afternoon. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about how cities reshape uh, food systems. Um, food value chains are being transformed worldwide, and so 
if you would talk to a, a number of people and, and get at the drivers of change, you will end up mm. with basically mm. three major driving forces that are leading to change. First, you have population growth. Population is rapidly growing. This means more food has to be uh, produced. <coughs> income is growing in, 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 on average in the world. If income grows, people are going to eat different foods. And then the third big thing that we have discussed today is organization. Organization, people that live in cities, they are generally richer, so they eat different foods, and the food that are coming to the cities have to come from, from rural areas, so you have to market that food. So that is leading to uh, quite some uh, changes in these value chains. If you look at what we know about this rural-urban value chain, it's actually very uh, little. So there's surprisingly little research, knowledge, and data in uh, developing countries in, in this area. And so what I'm going to do here, very briefly, is present some of the results of work that we have done in three Asian countries, in China, in Bangladesh, and one African country, uh, Ethiopia. And so we're going to focus on the major cities in these uh, countries and on, the main, and on some major value chains. So in Asia, we, got, we did some surveys on rice and potato. And in Africa, in Ethiopia, we looked at death. Death, very important cereal in Ethiopia. First, some very simple statistics. It will be mostly what I'm going to present is very simple descriptive statistics trying to get at what do we actually know about the functioning of this uh, rural urban value chain. One important statistic is how important is this off-form segment in rural urban value chain. So there are a lot of misconceptions about it because actually we often like data on, on, or representative data on how important um, the off-farm segment is this, the marketing segment. So we did this service in uh, trying to look at the supply of rice to these major cities. Uh, and so we divided that by the most common rice and the better quality rice. And so for uh, Dhaka and Beijing in Delhi, you see uh, in blue, you see the share of the, the farmers in the final retail price. And the red part is the margin, is basically what's going to what is going to the marketing sector. And so you see for the most common rice variety that actually the share of the farmer in the final retail price is very high. And that's a consistent thing that's coming back in all these countries. People will often not believe that, but if you look at the numbers, it's actually the farmer that the farmer that gets the biggest share of the final uh, retail price. So in the case of rice, we're talking about between 70, 70 and 80 percent is going to uh, the farmer. Now these things are changing if we're going to better quality products. And so these better quality products are becoming more and more important. People are becoming richer, there's more demand for better, better quality products, even in these developing countries. And so these better quality products are taking off. And if you look at these better quality products, the margins are bigger there. Okay, the share of the farmers are becoming smaller, and so what is being absorbed by the marketing sector, the processing sector, is becoming relatively more important. Because there's more processing happening, there's more branding happening, there's more packaging happening, there's more uh, activities happening. Previous example was the example of rice. This one, the example of potato, a little bit more per perishable than rice, still pretty high numbers of the share of uh, the farmer in the final retail price, about 50 to uh, 65 percent. Share is coming down if you start looking at the, at the lean period. So after a period of storage, potatoes are being stored. So then there's the opportunity the cost of money being stuck in those potatoes. There is the, the storage cost, and so that's pushing up the price in, in the lean period. Similar path pattern in Ethiopia, you look at the cheapest crop, the red death, so the marketing uh, part is smaller than for the more expensive uh, death, the white death. Okay, so the red part is, is going down for the, the least uh, expensive variety. 
So these are numbers, actually, there is very little uh, good solid service out there on this. <coughs> okay, then we looked a little bit in all this service that we did, we tried to understand what kind of dynamics are happening in this uh, rural urban value chains. First big thing is transformation of uh, technology, technologies. If you look at the rural rice mill segment, you see su substantial investments in expanding and upgrading of uh, milling equipment. You see the larger mills uh, using more expensive equipment. They start polishing rice, double polishing rice, and you see incre increasing uh, grade differentiation. And so if you start uh, differentiating grades, you start to go for the upper part of the market, you can actually capture more uh, value. More efficient cold storage technologies have become available, and I will talk about that uh, later. Transformation in the marketing systems. You see this intermediation happening. So the, you see the decline of village traders. They were a little bit very important in these traditional marketing systems. They are actually uh, losing a little bit of their importance. We see emerging vertical integration where the larger mills start dealing directly with, with a number of limited large wholesalers. <coughs> And then you see branding taking off, okay? Emergent of branded rice, uh, especially by the medium and the large mills. If there is no branding happening from the product, there is still a move from selling loose rice to packages, packages or packaged rice, even without any brand driven on it. So the packaging is, is, is taking off in all of these countries. On the trader segment, what see we happening there? We see that these products are coming from much further than, than before. We see geographical, geographical lengthening of the value chain. For example, in, in Beijing, we see rice coming from areas 1,500 kilometers away from Beijing, a major supply area for, for rice for Beijing. In India, you see Agra, the region around Agra, is really becoming a cluster of the production of potato. Really. Uh, it becomes a very important cluster of production of potato that is all going to uh, Delhi. Um, then the rice wholesales in urban cities increasingly buy directly from uh, medium and large mills. So you see an upscaling uh, happening and disintermediation. Transformation of value chain, chain finance. Uh, we see the disappearance of tight output credit markets. So before you had a trader giving money to the farmers to be able to buy inputs. That is kind of disappearing. It's not showing up in our data anymore. Very little uh, importance of that type of credit. Advances from clients to mills and from traders to retailers is becoming more common. And then credit from these modern storages uh, are becoming a very prevalent. So farmers store their sacks of potato in these modern, uh, store, uh, modern cold storages and they give credit for that, uh, for that cycle. Very big uh, change. Other changes that we saw happening uh, in the transport sector. So there's much more pro produce that has to be transported from these rural areas to the urban areas. So you see a change in the number, in the type of trucks that are being used to transport goods. Okay, in the case of Ethiopia, here we saw these trucks that were that could transport five to six tons. They were about seventy-five percent of all the trucks coming to the city in two thousand and one. In two thousand and eleven, their share has had come down to about uh, sixty percent. Okay, so this. The smaller trucks are, are slowly disappearing and we're going to, to bigger trucks. Seven to eight ton trucks and also trailers of, of 20 ton trucks. 20 tons. Because you have upscaling of the sector, you have bigger trucks. In the case of Ethiopia, you also have better roads. These markets are become more integrated, integrated and these margins are becoming down over time. Okay, this is the graph that shows uh, the price so the lower the lower line is the this one is the line of the producing area in the kelly area a very major maize producing area the horizontal axis is the line for Addis, 
major city, and then the top line is a food, the food deficit area. And you see over time that these margins are being squeezed. Okay? It's becoming smaller and smaller because of better infrastructure, because of the bigger trucks being used. So these markets are, these margins are becoming smaller, these, these uh, markets are becoming better uh, integrated. Similar squeezing happening in the milling sector. If you look at, at, at uh, the cost of the, the milling cost over time, in the case of Ethiopia, at least where we had data, we see that these milling costs are coming down. So upscaling, becoming more efficient, you know, becoming a, a better, uh, more efficient marketing system. Storage. Um, so in the case of Bangladesh and India and the potato sector that we studied, we, we saw this large scale cold storages uh, taking off. And so they start replacing wholesale markets as a center of, of trade. So we have this data going from 1965 to 2010. You see really in Bihar, one of the most remote areas in, in, in uh, India. So you see this modern cold storages taking off there in every place. So the farmers, the small scale farms, are going to store there. They're going to use that as a center of uh, storage, a center of trade. That's how they look like, you know. So the, these are the areas where they store these sacks. This is this modern uh, building that has been built. And then uh, all this, in the, in the bottom picture, is all these people come there to these cold storages and start to do their trade there at, at, that, point, at that place. Okay, it's not happening at, at, the, at the wholesale market anymore. So we see enlargement also of its coverage in distance, as we said before. In the retail segment, what we see happening there is the penetration of, of supermarkets that are coming in. Okay, so in, in Delhi, for the staples, they were about 7%. Uh, at that point, when we did the survey, coming basically from 0%, you know, five years ago. In Beijing, Supermarkets, 50% of all the rice being sold there. So 25 years ago, there were no supermarkets. Okay, so a very quick rise in, in the retail segment of these uh, supermarkets. Supermarkets are often uh, selling staples more cheaply than uh, traditional shops, okay, and that's why they, they take off. The impact on farmers, um, so some graphs from uh, Ethiopia. The further away you are, the less. The further away you are from the city, the less you rely on markets. And just some two graphs to illustrate that. The first graph is the use of herbicides for farmers that are close to Addis compared to those that are remote, and how that has changed over the last ten years. So the red line is 10 years ago, the blue line is the, the situation at the time of the survey. And so you see that, first you see a gradient, okay? So the further away you are from the city, the less you use these small inputs. Okay, so for the 10 years ago, herbicides was used by 50% of the farmers for those living close to Addis, while those far away, they were not using it at all. At the time of the survey, basically everybody was using, fertile, uh, was using herbicides if you were living close to the city. And then you, you see the strong gradient uh, going down. The use of improved seeds on, on the right side. So there was not a lot of improved seeds 10 years ago. At the time of the survey, 80% of those living close to the city using improved seeds. Those guys far away from the city, they were not using anything. So then we started looking in, in, in some joint work that we have been doing with, with Jorgen van der Kastelen. Started looking at, you know, what's the impact of being connected to the city to productive yields? What's the impact on, on labor productivity? What's the impact on input costs? What's the impact on profits? And so we see some very striking trends. Uh, for those villages living uh, close to Addis, they have about they have yields that are that are about 50% higher than those far away. Labor productivity, very important. If you're talking about poverty elevation, you have to get labor productivity up. So you see very strong gradients over space, basically a doubling. Okay? <laughs> for those guys close to the city, they have double a level of labor productivity compared to those guys that are uh, remote. 
best inputs are going up, best profit profits are going up. So the, the ability to having access to a city has a big influence on a lot of agricultural uh, practices and marketing practices. So what do we see? We see transformation of value chain driven by urbanization because of different diets and higher incomes. We see processes of modernization of farms, upscaling, disintermediation, supermarketization and uh, branding. You see that the off-farm segment in food will become more important and more attention should be paid to that. So there are huge challenges and opportunities in guiding this uh, process. Uh, we have, with our results, looked uh, with our research, looked at a number of cities. We have small samples. We have some initial res results of what to expect, but a lot of things are still unknown, uh, and so we would call for further research in this area. presentation uh, showing us that in fact we are looking at that upscale scale up, larger scale, uh, distance to, to cities matter a lot, uh, specifically for, for income uh, of uh, farmers. And in fact you also alluded a little bit about the, uh, the, the middle segment, um, how that is increasing, uh, a point brought up this morning by, uh, by uh, Shannon Fan, as uh, in fact a kind of black box that is increasing. So over over to you. I invite uh, let's see around two or three questions. Yes, the gentleman will please introduce yourself. I'm Magnus Eastum from Lund University, Sweden. Uh, first, I wonder how you define cities. Have you been looking at? And secondly, you have been looking at some of the the major staple crops. If you had looked at uh, more high value crops. We have talked today a lot about vegetables and so on. What would the general trends have been, the, the figures you have been showing? Is it possible to speculate on that? Thank you. I am Hanneke Lange from Agenda um, You spoke about the growing demand for more food, but also for different kinds of foods. I was wondering in your research if you seen evidence of farmers being uh, able to respond to that change in needs uh, and not what are the main risks or challenges for farmers to do so. You talked about a transformation process and Just a second for the microphone. So you talked about the transformation process and there was a strong influence of urbanization in those three cases. Did you, were you able to measure any effect on farm size? Ethiopia has a special land tenure system, but in the other two countries that system is more free. Okay. Yeah, for the cities, um, yeah, how do we define a city? We just took, in, in the case of these four countries that we looked at, we just took the biggest city in the country, basically. Okay. But so we are doing some further work trying to look at the impact of secondary cities and, and so did the you are in Monte Castile and in Leuven, you we have some one paper already on looking at the impact of the secondary cities on price formation and intensification. And we see very similar trends that happen actually. But yeah, so we didn't, didn't have a specific survey for that. Um, on the impact on other crops, um, we haven't looked at that yet, but so the, the but we're planning to do some work. We're actually going to do we're, at the end of the year, we're going to do a big study looking at the dairy value chain in Ethiopia. We're doing the same methodology in Seattle, but what's happening now. Um, but in general, you see uh, the trends that when these cities grow, they, uh, ur people in urban areas, they eat more uh, fruit and vegetables, they eat more uh, dairy products, they eat more meat. And so you actually see that these areas around these cities, they start responding to that. So they start producing more. 
fruit and vegetables, they still have to do some of these dairy products in a big way, so these belts are developed around this, around the big cities. Um, okay, the form size effect, this is a very good question, there's a little bit getting at Tom James' talk, right? So, uh, in Ethiopia, this is not happening because you, you cannot, you cannot uh, <coughs> buy land basically, so, so it stays small there. But what you saw happening in India is that these uh, rental markets, actually there is a limit on what you can own as a, as a, as a land owner as well, but these rental markets were becoming very active. And so you saw big farms emerging in the Anagawa area that would, that would rent in land from 300 people you know, and try to consolidate and really come up with big quantities of the So you saw things happening. That, that will be interesting to follow. And that's a little bit what Tom Jim is actually yeah. heading at. You know, suddenly you have these big urban markets, there's money to be made, and so on. Maybe China? China, we haven't seen that happen. The land rental markets expand too. Yeah, that, that is the common yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, I, I think that's all the questions that you asked. Thank you very much. I personally also find this very important because you, in fact, sketch the kind of opposite to what some consumers in uh, Europe are now trying to gather, going a little bit back to smaller scale um, uh, food systems, going a little bit like lessening the distance between producers and consumers, um, bringing consumers closer to, to farms, etc. This is, of course, what you sketched, it's not you, but still I'm, I'm very much triggered because you see both <laughs> dynamics I feel in the world. But I think we have time for uh, another two questions. Yeah, there's one in the back, and then uh, let's two questions. Okay, briefly start in the back, and then we'll go here. I'm a Jason University of Berlin. My question was um, Do you notice any, or do you expect that food systems can reshape cities in African context? Because at the beginning, it has been mentioned that in Africa there is no urban planning uh, or, or urban, uh, urban settings are growing in informal way or just with uh, non substantially global planning uh, from, from, from the policy makers. Do you think that food systems can reshape the existing cities in African context? I would just like to, to add some comments what was what you also mentioned. You see, maybe you see something different in Europe. You say by consumers demanding uh, short and short cycles, short interactions with consumers. I think you see the same in Beijing, where there's a huge demand of tourism around Beijing. So pick your own cherries, etc. That kind of high value crops and paying for that is also you can see around cities. So I would like to challenge you and, and other researchers not to look only at the the one type of commodity or one type of crop, but look at the multiple functions and the interactions also beyond the agricultural system to look into price interactions because there's much more demand. I think uh, talking about waste recycling, talking about clean water, uh, climate change uh, adaptation or, or mitigation, those kind of issues are very relevant to, to the city planners. Uh, so not only looking at how is the agriculture system changing, but what would be the possibility of linkages and synergies with, uh, with other systems. That's the last question. It's really, really quick. Um, very interesting presentation. Uh, you mentioned that cities are incentive to be more productive. Yeah, especially, you were referring to this uh, comparison between those that are nearby or in the, in, in the vicinity as compared to those that are long distance. So I was wondering if you, uh, in your research, have, have you perceived any difference uh, in terms of the incentive that they have to produce more environmentally friendly. Okay, so yeah, very good uh, 
questions and suggestions. I think the two first, the first two remarks are actually suggestions. I think it's a very interesting question that actually the, the, the food systems might shape the, the cities and not, not the reverse, right? So, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that would be something very interesting to, to look at. Synergies, you know, obviously our, our study is very limited. But you were actually already surprised that when we started looking at the literature, there's actually very little data available on just understanding what you know and tracing it all the way from the rural areas to the, the urban areas. But so there is much more to be done, and so it would be interesting to look at all these you know, synergies. The incentives for environmental friendly products. Um, there was not a lot there yet at the point when we were doing the study. So really, there was quite some upcoming demand for organic produce. Uh, that was a big thing, but it was still very much a niche market. So we were, we were looking at the share of organic produce being sold in the city. We were talking about 0.5% of the supply into the city would be uh, organically. Produce. But that is an upcoming thing that will become more important over time. But at that point, when we did study, it was not, it was not yet a demand for that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think, especially the question about food systems reshaping cities, I mean, that's beautiful, that question. And the beauty of this event, of course, is that researchers and practitioners come together. So I definitely hope that we do have some, I thought we had one urban planner in the room, but I also hope we do have some people in the room that do uh, policy development and take all these lessons into account and, and, and shape their own policy development around it, taking those lessons home. Um, I think also something we, we really should uh, keep in mind while uh, progressing through our these days is the call for diversity that came out of the room just now. Uh, if you look at food security and nutrition, uh, the demand and the needs go beyond the mere staple. So I, I find that very important as well. But we have one more uh, very interesting speaker, uh, Dania Grace, who will uh, go a little bit more into the informal markets. And um, it may be a wrong perception, but I always think that informal markets. Uh, being more informal will have a closer link between producers and consumers. But I'll leave it to Dania, of course, to, to explain more about it. Dania, she is an epidemiologist and a veterinarian, and she works for ILRI in, in Kenya. If I can use a few keywords to describe you, uh, food safety is important, emerging diseases, gender, uh, gender is, uh, animal welfare is, and, and I think you are also a very a successful researcher who's published quite a lot of uh, uh, in quite a lot of publications. The floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here at this uh, important meeting. So today I'm going to talk about um, informal markets. Uh, starting with the first question, we're here to talk about urbanization, but who feeds the cities and who may feed the cities and um, what, what can we do, what can policy processes, donor investments do that might move this in a bad way or might move this in a good way? And I'm going to, to start with just a quick walkthrough of an informal value chain to, to, to place us all where we're going to be. Then I'm going to move on to talking about some common myths around the informal sector. The first is that the informal will fade away, and this may add a little bit on to the, to the previous uh, presentation. Uh, the second is that informal consumers don't care about food safety. Then, and the next two myths are things which I find people almost never believe unless they've really read a lot of the evidence, which I probably won't have time for, but I will at least just, just challenge your thinking with it. Um, the myth that the informal sector is dangerous and the formal sector is safe, and the myth that we can regulate our way to safer food and that more rules mean better practice. Um, and then I will finish with a couple of quick slides on some ways forward. So we'll, we will take our example, the, the pork value chain, um, which typically starts with small order production. Most of the places we work, the majority of fresh foods, be they vegetables, pork, eggs, poultry, are produced by smallholders. And they're generally produced on small farms and often with relatively poor biosecurity. Here you can see a pig just tethered and 
in a relatively open environment. Um, these pigs are then aggregated, and again, they come from all, all over and all places and all colors and all sorts. They're not really traceable, and, and so it's hard to know where they've come from. Um, and then they're mixed in ways which, as an epidemiologist, give it very nice opportunities for mixing pathogens, both pig pathogens and pathogens from other places. Um, then they're killed. They're killed in all sorts of ways. This is a particularly interesting one in Nagaland, where they're speared to the heart with a, with a blow behind the elbow. Um, but the different ways they're killed have one thing in common, and that animal welfare is never applied. And this has consequences both for the animal, but also for the quality of the meat and, and also for other things. And I would say in many of these countries there are rules about animal welfare, but I've never seen them applied. And then when they're killed, they're processed. And here's a nice example of how these um, modernizing agri-value chains make things worse from an epidemiological point of view. Because you can see, as opposed to killing a, a pig in a backyard, here you've got a situation where someone has invested in infrastructure and, and all the rest of it, but these investments are actually making the pork less safe. This is a much more traditional uh, version where nobody has really in invested in infrastructure. Um, and here you can see that uh, one of the other issues around the, these systems is the environmental hazards. Here their way of managing waste is to chuck it over the, the side into the jungle, which is okay when you've got a lot of jungle and very little pig. But when you've got a lot of pig and very little jungle, then you start running into environmental problems. But again, when we see these modernized systems, they, they often really are not, they're modernized, if you might say, in the infrastructure, but they're not modernized in the practice. So you're getting some benefits, but you're not really getting what the system was sent up to deliver. But there's something else important here, and that is the importance of these systems for providing employment for women, women, youth, children even. Um, and as we see, and we've done studies on this, as these systems do kind of step up the step for modernization and complexification, the women tend to drop out. Um, once they've been slaughtered and cleaned, then they have to be taken to a place to be sold. And again, we're seeing um, uh, modernization be being used to a certain extent. Uh, indeed, intensification here with the, the, the three big system, as opposed to the one big system. And there's even some diversification with, with pigs in the front and, and cattle in the back. And what a, sort of the message here is that these are highly, I would say, entrepreneurial, innovative systems which are self-adapting, self-organizing, but they're often doing it in ways that are not as the planners intended and not the same way these value chains are operating in, in countries where we might we have what we might call modern agri-food systems. So then they're sold. And most of them are still sold in the informal sector, small retailers who, who lack infrastructure, who don't have cold chains, uh, who sell from kiosks. Uh, and these, key, these have issues in terms also of uh, food safety, of environmental conditions. Um, but they also offer employment and they offer, in many of these places, for example, again, it is women who have a big role in retailing food, and women absolutely dominate processing food and a lot of street food, so, so other things to think about when we talk about modernizing food production. And finally, they are eaten, and I must say these are two dishes I have uh, uh, partaken of, and, and very nice they were too, and as we will briefly mention, things can be pretty kind of rough, you might say, here and there, higgledy-piggledy, if I remember, along the value chain, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the end product is going to be d dangerous and kill people. And a lot of our work has looked at the actual risks. We're not saying hazards, we're not saying what's in the meat, because there might be a lot of those things in the meat you wouldn't want in the meat, but what is the actual risk to human health? And that is a key point which most people don't get. When we understand food safety, we mustn't in, in poor, resource-poor context, it's not very helpful to focus on what hazards. We need to focus on the risks to human health. And if we continue to make legislation based on hazards, not on risks, it's going to be anti-poor and anti-women. So that was a quick walk through the, the value chains, who is, who is currently, uh, currently feeding the cities. Uh, and now I'm going to talk again quickly about some of the myths around the informal food sector. 
This is based on, on a number of research which we've done over the last 10 years, much of which has been published through various reviews and, and books. Um, I'm just going to, to leave them there. They're easily, if you put in my name and Google informal food, you will find these, because I won't have time to go through all the references or methods or details of the study, but just if you want them, uh, they are there. So the first myth is that the, the informal sector is, is going to fade away. Now, we should just quickly mention that at the moment, most fresh foods are produced and sold in the informal sector, and they are cheaper. Um, there are many advantages to wet markets. Here are some of them we collected from focus group discussions. But one of the big ones is, is they are currently cheaper. Unlike some of the staple foods, um, and when supermarkets took over America in the 1930s, they were selling food at 14% cheaper than the informal sectors, the mom and pop stores they replaced. For the fresh foods, it's the other way around. Supermarkets are selling anything from 20, 50, 200% more. And while that price differential continues, it's hard to see that the supermarkets will take over the fresh foods, uh, certainly to the extent that they've taken over the, some of the other areas. And even in places like, um, uh, like Malaysia, for example, which is a relatively middle class country, we see that two thirds of customers prefer to go to these wet markets for their fresh foods. They may be buying their rice in a supermarket, but the fresh foods are, and there's a lot of debate here, I won't go into it, but certainly the latest, um, and there's a paper out by EFAD, which just came out a month ago, um, seems to suggest that this was premature rush to thinking everything will be a supermarket in five, 10 years, it's not going to happen. This is some modeling from Shirley from, from, from based on East Africa. And here you can see that as far as 2040, the informal, this big blue block, is going to be a big way that most people get their foods. So informal is probably set to stay with us for a while. And there's a lot that can be done to make that more likely or less likely. The next point is that poor people don't care about food safety. Now, I think most people know that's, that's less true for countries like maybe China and Vietnam. China, where they, they showed their commitment by executing the head of the Food and Drug Administration when, when he, he got things wrong. Um, and in Vietnam, where they've done surveys showing that food safety is people's number one occupation. USA did a big countrywide survey, higher than governance, higher than education, higher than hospitals. So obviously, food safety in these, these areas is quite important and for good reasons. But even in the countries I work in more in, in Africa, these markets which we think people are less aware of food safety, the evidence suggests not, not only do they say they care, they're also willing to pay certain premiums for food which they think, usually wrongly, by the way, is safer. When there are scares, again, when, when people are, again, usually wrongly worried about food, so there's a foot and mouth a disease outbreak, pigs are dying all over the place, it's not as a no so no one's going to die from eating a pig with foot and mouth disease, but people stop buying pork, they move to poultry. Um, and again, we saw in, 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 in Kenya, there's this um, marketing firm which markets to poor consumers sausages. Sometimes it's the only meat they get, it's sold to the slums or barrows. The, double, the, the World Health Organization brought out a report linking processed meat to cancer. These risks were trivial. The media went to town on it. These sausages, one of the few sources of animal source food, were <coughs> sold to poor people in slums. Sales dropped by more than 50%. So again, how these, sort of me these messages get wrongly interpreted and create much nutritional harm by stopping people eating animal source food. So food safety is very tricky. We, people get it wrong, and, and it has effects on nutrition, equity, all sorts of things. The formal sector is not necessarily safe, not even formal risky. I won't have time to go through this because most people don't believe it, but here is just one study we did in Vietnam. Here is the emerging formal sector with the supermarkets, all nice and clean, white coats, electricity, cellophane. Here is the informal sector, uh, which it is hoping to replace with a lot of policy and then donor and, and other people telling them, get rid of her, go to this and everything will be fine. No one will get sick and you'll all be happy. Um, when we actually do the studies comparing the bacteria, the, 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 the risks associated with, with these, uh, um, in terms of the wet market, traditional is purple. The supermarket is blue. None of it is as good as it could be, but you will see that the, the, the meat being sold, unacceptable fecal bacteria, nobody really wants fecal bacteria in their food. Much, much worse for the supermarkets than it was for the wet markets and in the village. 
best of all. So these studies we've done now in a whole range of places, it's not invariably true, but overall the strong tendency is that the formal sector um, is often worse or no better than the informal in terms of food safety. More rules, uh, again, a common delusion, I might say, among the, the, the policy makers and people we work with is that you can regulate your way to food safety. Um, not only can you not regulate your way to food safety, as witnessed by all of these, one of the previous speakers, my uh, colleague from Kenya, mentioned how he thought Africa was over-regulated. I mean, there's no shortage of regulations. There's all of the, everything is basically regulated and nothing is implemented. Um, but not only does it not make any difference, which everybody knows, but we, we've also made, done some studies which show how it can actually make things worse. And here's a study from Uganda, urban dairies, which were illegal, by the way. Um, first of all, first message, the, the, runner, the owners of these dairies are the real risk managers. These men and the women are doing all of these good practices, which is helping keep that milk safe. So the risk managers in the informal market are the farmers, the, the, the processors. Secondly, the farmers who were getting harassed by the authorities were investing less in food safety. And again, this is something we see. It's the sort of the prohibition phenomenon that once you make something illegal, then there's a race to the bottom. And we see this in other places too, that, that the, the more the, the government gets empowered to sort of harass people and, and try and force their way into implementing these rules, kind of the worse everything gets with everybody, not just livelihoods, but often also food safety. So different ways of working with these sectors and, and what might they be. Well, talking about some of the ways forward, we, we've seen a lot of um, interesting, uh, and nice case studies and, and, and very sort of promising, what we might say promising things with, with high potential. Um, there's a saying that pilots never fail and that pilots never scale. And one of the things I think we need to think carefully about is what I call denominator data. So there's, it, there's lots of nice examples of, you know, million dollar projects who've worked with hundreds or even thousands of farmers and have got great results, at least while the project was there. But some of these are not really taking us to the hundreds of millions and the billions of consumers, which is really the sort of scale we need to be thinking about. So um, in, in the program, the research program I work in, which is called Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, and is, is, is led by IFPRI with a number of other CG centers, we've been thinking about scale in terms of theories of change and in, in basically working with what is there, which is already delivering food at, at scale, and often with lots and lots of co-benefits that disappear once you start investing in modernizing and improving it, um, and seeing how we can then get that extra safety, improving those environmental issues, that better work conditions for women, the opportunities for youth, animal welfare, if, if that can be a win-win too, and sometimes we think it can. And we call this theory of change analysis. And as again, this is, this is all published, um, so I won't go into it because of time too. But my last slide is that some of the examples we've had which is basically working with the informal sector actors in a very participatory way, which makes them really part of the solution, not part of the problem. And it's working through professionalizing them. Importantly, it's identifying incentives. We heard about the business case, and I think this is absolutely key. But it doesn't have to be a profit. We found in some cases that, that where these middlemen were being neglected, that they were willing to change their practice simply by being given a seat at table to discuss with government, which they never had before. And others, people are willing to do things because they get their names in the paper and photographs of them in the paper. So uh, I think we started a bit naively thinking that if it's profit only, that if people will get more profits, they will sell their food and it will be safer. And we found that that wasn't actually happening. But incentives must be there, but, but we need to be more sophisticated about, it, about incentives. So we've done this network now in several areas. It's, it's, as I said, it's documented in some of those papers, but just to give you two of the successes. These were projects which all both ended about five to 10 years ago. They're still running. Currently, 70% of dairy traders in Assam and 24% in Kenya are registered. Um, economic analysis has shown high levels of benefit um, and, and millions, we're talking about millions of beneficiaries. So with that, my, my key messages are that we need to better understand the multiple benefits and also risks associated with informal food. Understand how policy is, alas, often part of the problem and is making things worse in many ways while it is trying to make things better because it doesn't understand un unintended consequences. And to support those interventions which really do seem to work 
and be scalable. So thank you for your attention. interesting and revealing uh, presentation um, and also thank you for your clear ways forward to at least not expect to fail out of the informal sector because, it, because it's there to stay and also how to work with the informal sector in a very participatory approach. Um, again, I think we have um, uh, time for let's say three questions. I say one, two, three to the side, please. So maybe we'll first. Thank you, Delia and Harold Spoiler from Game. If you you mentioned sort of a price comparison or cost comparison between the formal and informal sector, and you said perhaps the staple foods are in the formal sector cheaper, but the fresh produce, you believe that the informal sector stays cheaper. To what extent um, is that related or did you look into the fact that the formal sector may pay taxes and the informal doesn't? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Tilian, uh, for your presentation. I'm Mujahid Bayrak from Utrecht University. So, like there was one graph, like 100% of the supermarket food in Vietnam consists of fecal matter. Because I probably have to go to the doctor afterwards because I live in Vietnam. I have a question. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, many have mentioned it. Uh, it's quite, quite a new topic to me. But what ex exactly are formal and informal markets? Because, for example, I also lived in Hong Kong. And red markets were very much part, at least in my perception, as a formal market because the Hong Kong government would stimulate people to sell their produce uh, in, in, in wet markets. So uh, how, how could we define it? And maybe a second question is, Related to the food from supermarkets, was that like mainly imported? Was that mainly domestic? Because I visited farmers in China, and very often they would have two plots of land. They would have a very big plot of land, which would be exported to somewhere else, and they would have a very small plot of land, which would be for own consumption. And then you would be asking, well, why is that? Well, our own plot of land, we treat it very well. We don't put too much pesticides on that. <laughs> and a big plot of land, well, we don't put pesticides on that, and we export that. So I was very much interested in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Grace. And I don't have an interesting profile. The same that I worked for about eight years in Nigeria and NGO before I came to Europe to further my studies. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, since morning, I've been listening to all the issues that I raised, but something has been missing, which you have really touched on, and I want to appreciate you for doing that. The nation of women. Coming from Africa and knowing how marginalized women are in different sectors, but also knowing that women are the majority in the agricultural sector as workers as, as those holding the fort, they are, they are always marginalized to an extent in many communities. There are women's social networks in urban and rural areas and of course not agriculture. They lack access to markets. They lack access to in, they don't have access to incentives to, to push them. To, to land like and they don't have living cages, they don't have um, opportunities to bring themselves to link to the international um, ma uh, market. So I thank you very much for touching on that issue and I, in, in looking at informal um, markets and in looking at um, establishing and strengthening our partnerships, they need to work with women because women are marginalized in different sectors. You know that Africans want not all communities with some are patriarchal and women don't have access. But in the agricultural sector, if you look at it with they are the ones in control of that sector that they are never mentioned. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Thank you so much. I think that does indeed uh, deserve an <laughs> Dave, would you like, like to comment on the questions, answer the questions? Um, yes, certainly. Um, well, first of all, the taxes, informal, traditional, I'll come to that, wet markets, definitely they pay taxes. I think they pay a far higher proportion of their, their, their money goes to all sorts of municipal authorities they're paying, they're paying off inspectors. In, in, in Kenya, you have to buy a health certificate through a middle person, a middleman, which, because there's, there has been this sort of creeping regulations as governments too, short of money and structural adjustment, seek to income generate by, by 
taking money off entrepreneurs, many of whom are in the informal sector. So they may not pay formal taxes, but certainly they are paid money illicit, illicit to, to government authorities. And in fact, we find that the formal sector, we don't have time to go into it now, it's a political economy question, but in many cases there's this whole issue of capture and they are far too much in bed uh, with the actual government, which, which sort of can mean an unlevel playing field in, in different ways. Um, Secondly, the Vietnam study, 100% of the pork in supermarkets fail to meet the standards. So there is a standard that there is no more than whatever, 1,000 fecal bacteria per gram of pork. So I don't mean it consisted of 100%, it was just 100%. So please, cook it well and, and eat it with... with uh, in many countries, it's very traditional to drink beer while eating meat, and, and you know maybe the alcohol is also a disinfectant. Informal, <laughs> <laughs> formal, it's tricky. And we we got into this a bit because you know it, it, there's a bit of an overlap between wet markets, traditional sector, informal. Typically, they're not. Basically, it's a difference between the, the modern industrial, large scale, you know, kind of recognised sector. Um, versus, the, it's a bit like the difference between a smallholder farmer versus a modern farmer. Um, but yes, I agree, and it varies from country to, to country. Yes, interesting what you said about China. Um, actually, it was um, IFPRI did one study looking with us looking at aflatoxins in Western Kenya. So the, the food with the le least aflatoxins was the one people ate themselves, kept to eat themselves. The, the highest, the next up, was the ones they sold on the market. And the most contaminated of all was the ones they gave away as gifts to friends and poor people. <laughs> 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 so undoubtedly so there, there is you know, that element. But in, in Vietnam, it was more a problem of how things were being stored and how long they were being stored rather than the actual pork. The pork all came from the same sort of soldier houses, so it was what was happening afterwards which made it less safe in the supermarkets. Um, and then the last question, yes, I mean, I think that's very important. And, and too often if people just look at it from a, a, a strict economics or a strict food safety, we forget about all these other issues, the environment, the role of women, uh, animal welfare, which, which, which do, they may not be so easy to put a price on, but they are incredibly important. And just one quick anecdote story from Nigeria, where we did a study looking at meat safety in butchers. We found that the, although these were all in the same market, the beef sold by women butchers was consistently and significantly safer than the beef sold by men butchers. And I think understanding more the role of women in these markets and, and the many kind of good things they're doing would allow maybe them to, to recoup some value from all of these things which at present are, are not being recognized by the market. Thank you so much, uh, Lydia. Um, and thank you also for that last uh, anecdote, uh, very well, well taken. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot go for the second round, so I apologize to that part of the room. So that's my assignment for the next year, the next session. <laughs> so whenever there's time for questions and, and, and comments, go to that part of the room, and maybe also the next chair will allow you <laughs> contrary to what I did. Just to recap, um, two issues of, of this second part of this session. Um, first of all, work with the informal sector in order to improve the food systems to work for uh, nutrition and, and food security. And the second part, again, I echo the important role of women uh, in the informal sector, but also in general the important role of women <coughs> in food security and nutrition. And I would like to hand back to the master ceremony. Thank you very much, Tina.